Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, next panel session we have here. So we have great panelists today for what is next for public sector open source collaboration. But first, I wanted to welcome uh, on stage to Nick Gates that is going to do a short intro uh, for this panel. Uh, so my name is Nick Gates. Uh, I'm a policy advisor at Open Forum Europe. Um, I've prepared some remarks for you, uh, so please bear with me. Um, I'm going to do a basically whip whistle stop tour um, today. So at OFE, I focus on the uh, public dimensions of open source, particularly in government. Um, much of what we see happening in public sector open source collaboration today is in large part driven by an imperative to build digitally sovereign infrastructure. A lot of people are talking about sovereignty. Um, basically infrastructure which allows Europe to feel control and punch back in a crowded geopolitical landscape. So across many areas, including regulation, um, but also investment, adoption, cooperation, we see a significant amount of activity and in some cases upheaval. So today I'm just going to showcase a few areas uh, where we see change happening. Uh, in terms of digital regulation, the last five years have seen the passage of the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, the European Data Act. Uh, the Interoperable Europe Act, the Cyber Resilience Act, and the, the Product Liability Directive, and the AI Act. Um, so this is a huge and forceful uh, assertion by the EU on the global stage to proactively regulate digital technology, services, and markets. Um, some might argue too much, in fact, um, all on the back of the success with GDPR. Uh, while the OS community generally seems to be doing better in organizing itself to provide inputs into these initiatives and processes than it did five years ago, OFE has played a small role in that. We consider the importance of OSS in the world, as well as its size and impact, um, uh, not quite enough. The level of political organization and representation is fractional compared to what it needs to be. You might say that the broader open source community in Europe is no longer being adversely affected by regulation, but we have also certainly not been highly successful in working with the EU to link up these initiatives as part of a broader vision. So member states can lead from the bottom up. For example, institutionalizing open source and strategies with supporting legislative frameworks can be an opportunity to complement direct regulation and build more conducive environments for adoption, innovation, and service delivery. Uh, we see examples like uh, Germany's Center for Digital Sovereignty, France's development of digital commons, or the passage of public money, public code legislation in Switzerland. Um, I would argue that a focus on ecosystem and building, ecosystem building and community investment is the best place to start, but we'll keep that conversation uh, going in the panel. In terms of public investment, uh, the situation for open source, uh, um, the situation for open source uh, funding is somewhat precarious. The next generation internet or NGI program is at risk, and there are huge and important questions about what the next version of funding looks like from the European Commission. How much funding will be available? How it is provided, and at what cadence? And whether it'll be directed towards innovation, maintenance, or a combination of objectives. This creates a certain level of risk for our ecosystem, um, a reality we must acknowledge while also constructively working with the Commission. Generally, diverse funding sources are a good thing, and we cannot rely on electoral outcomes to provide the OSS ecosystem with funding stability. It's an important and evolving piece of the pie, and one we'll always try to enlarge, but one we must not plan our fortunes around. What can we do? We should probably think bigger than project-based funding and support, some of what you might have seen with the NGI program. Some are calling for a big EU fund for open source uh, as part of the Commission's next multilateral, multi-annual, not multilateral, multi-annual financial framework, or MFF. Uh, and there's also proposals out there for a public digital infrastructure fund, both of which would also meet the strategic objectives of the European Commission's economic impact study on open source. Such prospective initiatives could be, um, and should be, we would say, complemented by member state funding. Um, it's important, though, to differentiate between innovation and maintenance and to make sure that those efforts do not step on the toes of one another. To fine-tune the actions of maintenance funding, uh, we can and should draw upon examples like uh, Germany's Sovereign Tech Fund, which Fiona will talk about, and link those up with a broader vision of OSS funding towards European public sector institutions. In terms of innovation, one opportunity is the European Digital Infrastructure Consortium, or EDIC, for digital commons. Uh, member states, France, Germany, Netherlands, and Estonia are seeking to invest significantly in digital commons at the state level, with money going, at least in theory, towards both innovation and maintenance of open source projects as digital commons. 
Um, the proposed funding for public digital infrastructure can be broadly situated within the bucket of innovation funding. But these distinctions are not perfect ones. While this all works itself out, member states must continue to help fill in the gaps. Um, in terms of uh, public sector adoption, uh, we are also seeing a continued push and pull happening between innovation and in government service delivery and the use of open source software by governments. In terms of technical integrations, we are likely to see new and novel innovation happening at the stack level, with governments investing more in cross-cutting interoperable uh, technologies with large-scale use cases. Cities and regions within countries are collaborating on open source solutions and packages, and we expect this trend to increase between countries, particularly when it comes to foundational layers which are interoperable. You might have seen this uh, this morning in, in Paolo's presentation. Uh, this tension is going to continue to play out in terms of what receives attention and financing. It remains an open question to me what version of a Europe stack this all forms into, um, but it is clear that this is an emerging policy priority for the next commission and one that all member states will need to be engaged on. In fact, uh, we've received word that proposals are being actively debated with the member states, and it remains to be seen how um, this will all intersect with the Interoperable Europe Act, which will be uh, implemented and enforced over the next years. Um, we think the European Commission has a great opportunity to lead and gather Europe's societal stakeholders, from national governments to industries in lighthouse open, lighthouse open source collaboration projects. Um, we see this with the Open Wallet Foundation, uh, in order to start the transition from passive users, users to active leaders. Um, this could be a great technical, technical and diplomatic policy effort. Um, I also see a trend in terms of cooperation. So this is towards continued and intensified cross-border collaboration, not just at the kind of member state level, but also between local and regional bodies. Um, the collaboration between the French and German governments, which Bastien can talk a little bit about, is one example of this. We know from research that the strength and activity of the open source community, including the availability of financing, provision of support resources, and opportunities for collaborative development can and does impact adoption. Public administrations might be more inclined to adopt open source technologies if they see strong, active communities around them. This is at the heart of the digital commons idea, um, which the French presidency has promoted uh, and which is being promoted right now through the NGI commons and other related initiatives. Furthermore, um, open source program offices or OSPOs um, have been proven to be an effective in, uh, instrument to boost capacities and promote coordination. We had a whole track on them here at the, at the summit. By addressing common challenges and formating, formulating collaborative solutions, it's apparent that public sector OSPOs will continue to play an instrumental role in ecosystem building, but they're going to differ country to country. Um, as we consider how this will all play out, let's just keep in mind that the public sector organizations themselves are not software vendors, um, and the capacity to teach the organization to realize the value from open source is going to be needed. Um, but we do believe OSPOs will continue to be vital vehicles to help interpret and respond to regulation, coordinate use of funding, and to drive adoption. It's kind of at the heart of the OSPOs for Good movement as well. Um, so these are just some ideas, and they're really meant to just give you kind of a tour of what is happening and what might happen. Um, but I hope that, you know, the answer to what is next for public sector open source collaboration is that really we must go further. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick, for sharing the idea and setting the ground. Because um, today here, we, we want this panel to be interactive. We really want to know what are the audience questions, challenges? What do you really want to ask this awesome speaker list here that in one second, I will just uh, welcome them to stage. So before that, um, I just want you to use your mobiles this time and go to uh, scan this QR, it will go to a dashboard where you can freely ask questions. Uh, I have it on my mobile, so I will be keeping an eye on those. You can even vote, you don't need to, if there is a similar question, just vote, because if there are a lot of questions, we will try to prioritize the, the ones that has more, more votes. Uh, so I'm just gonna wait a bit until everyone have access. And uh, saying that, I would like to uh, introduce our today's panelist. Um, and also, yeah, so Nick already <laughs> introduced uh, uh, himself, but uh, please, Fiona, if you would like to go on stage to uh, start the introductions while people keep adding questions. I don't have to. 
Uh, thank you, Anna, for the introduction and for opening words, Nicholas, and for the invitation. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm Fiona Krakenberger, co-founder of the Sovereign Tech Fund. We are an organization funded by the German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action, and our mission is to sustainably strengthen the open source ecosystem in the public interest. How do we do that? We invest in open source infrastructure in the public interest. Um, we support the maintenance, improvement, and securing a critical open source infrastructure and technologies that are used um, virtually everywhere. Um, they underpin, I think, any kind of imaginable um, open source development, and we are identifying these critical technologies and investing them. Uh, we are also trying to look at the open source ecosystem in a more holistic way, so we are also setting up programs, for example, the fellowship you might have heard about that we just launched. Um, we have a bug resilience program to increase the bug resilience and security posture of critical open source technologies. Um, and we all do this with uh, public interest in mind. So we are really looking at what are the technologies that are widely used, what are the technologies that should be secured with public money in the public interest. Um, well, we had one question that we, um, before I hand over to the next person to introduce them. Yeah, yeah, so, sorry about that. So the, the question, the first question to get introduced is, what is the biggest unrealized opportunity for open source in the European public sector. Yeah, uh, just as an impetus for the following conversation discussion that we were having. So um, we are doing, with the Sovereign Tech Fund, we are a comparatively small organization. We have a lot of money. We also, like, on the same hand, um, when you look at the scale of the problem, it's not a lot of money. We need more actors, need more resource. It's a big task. I talked about this yesterday in another panel. It's a big, big task that demands a lot of collaboration, orchestration of efforts. We need more actors and not less. Um, and there are currently conversations happening of various actors in the field to leverage the mission that we have on an EU level. And I think there's really, really an opportunity here that the EU shouldn't miss. There are people that are dedicated in the EU. There are organizations that are willing and are here in place. There are ideas that are shove already. We are testing a lot of concepts with the Sovereign Tech Fund. Um, so. I really think that leveraging this to a higher level, as this is a global resource, it is a shared resource, all this, these open source technologies that we're using, and I think there's really, really an opportunity for the EU with the next budget that they have to make significant and meaningful investments into the space to secure also the public interest um, on an EU level. And I think yesterday we talked about the UN engagement, and as I said, we need more actors and no less. But I think with the EU coming into the space, there's also an opportunity to, as we'll be talking about digital sovereignty also later, to really carry certain values forward and make sure that this term digital sovereignty is actually meaningful and means things like openness, transparency, collaboration rather than competition, because those are all values that we need to meaningfully support the ecosystem. Thank you. And uh, now I would like to welcome the stage to Bastian Gurry from the Inventory Ministry Digital Directorate. And I will repeat the question after you do the intro that is, what is the biggest unrealized opportunity for open source in the European public sector uh, for your perspective? Okay, thank you. So I'm Bastian. Um, Nice to be here, thanks for the invitation. And sorry, because I will have to leave for my flight earlier, early. Um, before I answer the question, so I, I lead the free software unit for the French Gov. We publish, use, and contribute to open source. That, that are the three main things we are trying to do. And we also um, walk the talk by having some collaboration with the German friends and other European countries. We invite other European countries to contribute to Open Desk and La Suite, what we're uh, building for civil servants. Um, I have a bad feeling because I see what happened for Open Data and because I need to leave in five minutes, uh, I need to be a bit dramatic, sorry. But I have a bad feeling that open data, the interest for open data in public sector started in 2010, achieved some kind of pike 2015, and kind of died um, four years ago, right? 10 years of this kind of curve. So open source for the public sector, the interest started 2020 when European Commission started the, the first OSPO. 
it's kind of achieving a pike maybe next year and I don't want it to die. <laughs> so how are we consolidating what we're doing? Like the, the German example is really rich in inspiration about the sovereign tech found, about Zendis. All this is um, shaping the, the, the open source in the public sector and we are striving to do the same in other countries and consolidating our relationships. But how can we make sure that this is not some temporary interest? How can we protect this even from the politics that are uh, paying for that right now? How can we uh, be future-proof for the next 10 years, not just for the next year? And politics is about short-term things, but I hope the, the, the open source in the public sector is for long-term vision. And for that, I think we need to think in terms of free software and the roots of the movement, not just in terms of digital sovereignty, not just in terms of digital commons, not just in terms of the latest uh, vocabulary that all politicians speak. That would be my core message. How can we uh, last more than five years and how can we protect the root of the movement the free software movement within the public sector. One of the answers that we have in France is to uh, stimulate this Blue Hats movement because we do believe that uh, free software is in the hands of those who care. And that are the developers from the uh, public sector organizations and those who are also already contributing to the outside uh, open source communities, um, participating to the GNU project, participating to the Linux uh, kernel development and so on and so on. So that, that would be my introduction. And the question was, what is the next opportunity? Yeah, I think you, you frame it quite well. Like, uh, uh, it would be like, what is the biggest unrealized opportunity for open source in the public sector? Well, the opportunity is that we saw those many open source projects being about all about innovation and then thinking too late about maintenance. Our opportunity is to think early about maintenance not just about what we do, but also about the movement we are building. So how do we maintain all these human resources? If I see too many familiar faces here because we are too few in the governments and we need to be more than that. We need to build teams of tens and you know, hundreds of people uh, within the public sector and to connect with each other to last longer than, and to take care of this community as the uh, the kind of human infrastructure for the maintenance of the larger open source movement in the public sector. This is not just about tech, uh, even the, like any open source community out there knows this is about the community and open source in governments is also about the community, not just um, high profile politicians deciding about the budget. Thank you so much. Thank you. And sorry, I can, I need to leave, but you have my coordinates and I trust the, the panelists to be to Thank you so much for spending time you. with us. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so now I would like to welcome a stay to Alberto Marti from Not again, yes. Open Nebula Systems. Yes. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I think we're not tired of me again already. So, um, yeah, I was a previous speaker. So, um, I am um, the VP of, of, uh, of Open Source Innovation at Open Nebula Systems, which is a Spanish company. We, we develop Open Nebula, that's a, a cloud and edge computing platform. Um, I was in the previous uh, presentation talking about the IPSI cloud. This is a large um, European project to build a, um, um, a cloud and edge uh, technological platform for Europe. It's 3,000 million euros from member states. 12 member states and, and uh, around 100 uh, companies, European companies. Um, and what was the question? No, I remember the question, I'm joking. Um, so it's a hard question. Um, I'm not going to say we need more public and private cooperation, because I guess we, everyone, everyone assumes that. Um, I think there are two things I miss from the from the public administrations when it comes to, to open source. One of them is leading the early adoption of some of the European technologies that we develop. So being really at the forefront of um, using and, and demonstrating that the technologies that we, we use at Europe, uh, we, we develop in Europe, are, 
are perfectly valid uh, alternative to the non-EU um, technologies. The other one is um, I would like to see the public administrations helping us to explore um, another model for, for open source development in which um, the social economy could, could be much more active. So instead of expecting people to become I mean, entrepreneurs on their own, I mean, these unicorns, these big investment in companies, personally, I would like to see public administrations leading also a change in the way we, we develop open source and we, we, um, we maintain that, that open source in the long term based on, on the cooperative model. So having developers um, coming together, creating their, their cooperatives under the social economy model um, and, and helping them thrive and, and develop also a new, a different relationship with the people that develops technology in Europe. So not just as employees of big tech or employees of, of European companies, but uh, exploring this other alternative. So making it more, more social. And I think the public administrations have, especially the local ones, they have this capacity to also to help this, uh, this, new, this new model to, to, to emerge. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for sharing your questions. Uh, the most voted one, I, I think, is a question for Fiona. How can we replicate the sovereign tech fund to other EU countries? How much time do you have? I'm talking about years. <laughs> um, thank you for the question. Uh, I got a similar question yesterday at the UN panel, and so um, we, we talked about a couple other topics that we could talk about, and one of them we probably won't get there, so I'm, I hope, Anna, you excuse that I'm already spoiling it. We're talking about what digital sovereignty means for society versus industry versus, um, what was the third one? I think public administration. And I think you can have different vantage points or, points or, or lenses to look at what digital sovereignty could mean, but eventually, um, how we define digital sovereignty, it is about the self-determined use of technology by society, by public administration and industry. So what I said before, the things that we deal with and the issues that we care about, they matter for all of us. So we all need to care about this. So like a little bit of an excurse, but what I want to point at is um, the way that we did it. So the topics that we deal with, this open source infrastructure, it matters for everyone. It's a matter of what story you decide to tell and who you want to be working with. Because we are funded by the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action, um, but there are many other ministries, many other public administrations and institutions that should care about this. And we're also having very productive conversations with industry leaders. Um, so I think to a certain extent, the conversation about open source infrastructure maintenance and digital sovereignty is really making a lot of progress. So more, institu more institutions understand why it matters to them. But it will, all, I think, for another couple of years to come, it will be important to identify who are the change agents in the public administration, what do they care about, what is part of their public program or their political program, what is the next expected um, government going to be, what is the coalition going to be about, and then making sure that you jump on these topics and explain to them why open source matters. Because there will be many, many different things that people will be talking about where open source actually matters, and you need to be able to tell the story. So that's one part of the answer. And the other one is why we're doing our best to move the conversation ahead. I still think that it will need committed individuals still to really push this forward. And we've seen a couple, I know that Bastian is doing a lot of this work and you need a lot of patience, um, but I think for another time to come, it will need smart heads like you all to push for this in your government to leverage the connections that you have. Um, we're doing the best uh, with my team. We're doing the best that we can to showcase that it's possible with the Sovereign Tech Fund and why it matters. So we're hoping, hoping that we can help you with that. Um, but I think you still need to identify the upcoming topics um, for which you have to tell the story why open source matters um, and then jump on that ship. Thank you. Uh, and this is a general question. So any one of the panels, if they want to step out, how do we create 
a government community. Do you have any recommendations to get us started? So I think we have a community, or at least we have the channels to provide um, communities of practice, but we haven't been doing a great job of linking them up, and I think it could use more centralized attention at the at the European level. So I see a lot of different um, OSPOs emerging throughout Europe, um, and there's a lot of research. LF has done good research. Uh, OSOR, which OFE is part of, uh, has published a lot of news and intelligence on OSPOs. Um, but just in terms of kind of the common elements and best practices between them, I would love to see kind of more knowledge of that filtering up um, and for some of these international fora to, to kind of um, bring these communities together. Any more additions? Yeah. Um, there have been conversations about the potential need for, um, for a European open source agency. So what do you guys think? Do we need just another agency? Would you like to see um, an, an, a, an agency at the European level coordinating this kind of stuff? Do you think it would be useful? I think it could bring some benefits, but um, I mean, it's just another agency. <laughs> what do you think? Who would like to see a, a European open source agency? Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to see an open source, European, a European open source agency? Yeah, it's very popular, right? I think it could be useful. I mean, I think I think I mean we see the I mean we see that at the commission level. So we we know the the OSPO that the uh, Digi Digit is running, but then um, then we see that a lot of funding on on open source comes from from other DGs. So Digi Digi Connect, and then they I know I mean they speak to each other, but it's technically a different a different part of the commission. So maybe also in terms of um, harmonizing things across the, the the European Union, it might be useful to have something at European level. Um, I think from the, the experience that we have in terms of the discussions we have in terms of uh, digital sovereignty, the most challenging thing is to bring uh, people together um, and, and build this trust. So I think the, the, um, the challenge that we have with the open source is not that different from the challenge that we have when we talk about digital sovereignty, which is bringing, identifying who, I mean, that minority within each of organization that understands this or has this concern or this is, sensitivity and then bringing them together with uh, with other people like-minded people and that's uh, that's that's i think something we still need at european level there is yeah yeah there is some yeah Uh, to high-level forum and annual union work program that it, uh, they are happening in the standardization domain mm. to have the equivalent also in the open source domain Could be. to set the priorities but also to analyze the tendencies, the, the trends, the ideas in the open source world. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, personally, still, I mean, it's not kind of... Um, main identifiable place where you go if you want from different perspectives as a citizen or a company or public administration where do you go at european level if you want to meet your peers people with the same the same um, concerns that you have the same interest yeah. okay thank you uh the next question is also uh, a theme for fiona i'm sorry we keep you busy uh how do you select projects worth investing at the Serene Tech Fund? And if you can send some guidelines or procedures. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, two different answers to that. So one of them, how the Sovereign Tech Fund does it. So we have a lot of technical capacity and knowledge on the team, which I think is really important also for any institution that we're imagining that kind of capacity and knowledge has to exist to a certain extent on the organization. Uh, we have a clear set of criteria that we use to select projects. We get a lot of good applications. 
We clearly don't have enough budget to support everything that we think is important, um, but we use criteria like uh, relevance and prevalence. We look at the public interest angle. Uh, we determine the vulnerability in many different ways. Like there are different ways to look at vulnerability, technical vulnerability, but also is it hanging by a thread? What does the financial support look like for um, the technology that we might invest into? Uh, we have a pretty thorough review process. It's, it goes through a couple of different entities, um, different sets of eyes look at the um, technologies. We do have the criteria listed on our website if you're interested in that. Um, if I may answer to this with a slightly different angle, because we, when we had our pre-conversations around this, we were also thinking about um, how should public institutions com contribute to the dependencies that they have. And, um, to the critical dependencies that they have. And there's a technical way to respond to that question. You know, you can, there are a couple of tools out there that can use to run through the um, applications that you're using for, I don't know, calendar scheduling, uh, whatever using in public administration. Um, and you can analyze that software. Uh, you can, you know, go through and determine what are the most critical dependencies that we have, what are the open source tools. You're probably, um, if you, there are a couple that we all probably share, but you might have more specific ones. But then there's also another thing that I just want to raise as we're also talking about OSPOs and their role in this. Um, in Germany, we have a pretty interesting approach. We have the Sovereign Tech Fund, and then we also have Zenders, who functions as almost like a de facto OSPO um, for, the, for the state. Um, and I think one of the most critical functions that Zenders actually has is indexation and knowledge about technologies that are being used, because that's a pretty big issue. Um, I think in any kind of public institution, no matter what administration level we're looking at, if we're looking at communal uh, municipalities or state government, UN, EU, EU has actually been doing a good job at indexa indexing the most critical technologies they have, and thus they have the knowledge necessary to determine the most important dependencies. Um, and I think that um, organizations like Xandas really serve as a good example of how they can be, as you were mentioning, an open source agency on the EU level. I think one of the most critical functions that they can have and the biggest service they can do for other organizations, companies, but also Sovereign Tech Fund, is creating knowledge and indexation of the technologies that are out there because people are in the back from Xandas. They know, like everyone who has been dealing with software in the public administration knows that this is usually the data quality is not that great about what technologies are even being used. We don't know. Uh, and it's definitely the first step that we have to take in order to secure the technologies that are out there. Thank you so much. So because we don't have a lot of time, thank you. So I know there are a lot of questions. Hopefully we will be able to truckle those and uh, have like a, I don't know, a, a blog post summary of this. Uh, panel and try to answer the remaining questions. Um, I would like to welcome a stage to all the panelists uh, to do a final remark and then uh, after that welcome Mirko for final words. Yeah, Alberto, go ahead. Thank you. Great. Okay, so final remarks. Um, a couple of years ago, we we had well, I, I run this kind of panel a panel with uh, well, kind of a discussion with uh, with Gael from the Eclipse Foundation at Fostem um, about the uh, the concept of European open source, and it was something like uh, is European open source a thing or something like that. So we discussed um, on the stage and then with the audience it was it was fun. Um, if if there is something we can call European open source, so I think my final remarks for you will be. Um, to give some thought to that question. So um, what is European open source for you? So what do you think that means? Um, and what are the practical implications if we acknowledge the existence of uh, something that we call European open source? Is that open source developed by European institutions, is, uh, by governments, by European companies, by European citizens? Because I think that in the next uh, year or so, I think we'll get we have to get very 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 practical in what we mean by European open source and why what kind of measures we put in place to protect the technologies that we develop in Europe the open source technologies we develop in Europe um, so that that's going to be a debate that we'll have we will need to have in the community in very practical terms in coming months so we develop strategic technologies in Europe and they are open source 
how we ensure in the long term that they remain European. Thank you. Uh, Nick? Um, so my background is in uh, international development. Um, there's a, a very heavy bias towards solutionism in international development. Um, and there's been a lot of focus in recent years on you know, digital public goods. Um, and I haven't seen a lot of that accompanying a you know, corresponding focus on kind of capacity building. It sounds trite, but starting with small steps and taking it from there, um, I think really does make a difference. I'm doing a study on, for a report on uh, OSS and local and regional public administrations and just the ability to find a GitHub repository that's available for a city government and to have a place that they've identified and you know user handles for people working in the public administration um, would go a long way. So I think there's a lot of these um, small steps um, that we can promote and that will help you know change things. Uh, in terms of the question around like European open source, um, I do think we are at a unique opportunity. I think there's kind of a perception, having worked outside Europe, that there um, is not a lot of innovation happening around kind of um, service delivery um, within Europe and within European public administrations. Um, but you know what I've learned working on European policy for the last years that's that's really not true. There's a ton of innovation happening, and in fact, Europe has a lot to contribute to the global conversation because there's an open di uh, by default approach in so many. Um, European public administrations, and those lessons aren't feeding up into the global conversation using all of the buzzwords that we've mentioned before. So I would really just hope that um, all of the stuff that we're doing at kind of the local level, that we can better define that and help it filter up so that we can, you know, add to a European kind of perspective on some of these values, even as we maintain an open source ecosystem that isn't just European, but there's really kind of a commons between countries uh, across the globe. Thank you. Fiona? Thank you. I would definitely second what Nicholas, uh, Nick just said. Um, I think there's currently a really big opportunity, as I mentioned before. We have people in place, we have ideas in place, we have concepts in place to really move ahead. Um, we are, um, you know, in Germany, we're testing the model of having this holistic approach to open source on a, a state level, and I think there's much to be copied. We're here, you can talk to us, we've learned a lot, um, we've made mistakes, we're doing hopefully most of the things right, and we're happy to share that. Um, I think also there's like a political and a technical urgency that I want to close with. Uh, there's a technical urgency. Um, the technologies that we look at, the ecosystems that we look at, the pressure is growing by the day. We have more and more software being produced. Um, there are things like AI happening, as you might have noticed, and the pressure is increasing ever more on uh, entire ecosystems and a lot of volunteer maintainers and support is needed. And we need more in the... Um, sort of the, the community of actors that are trying to support um, open source in many different ways. There's also a political dimension to this for sure. Um, at the heart of what we do is um, are a lot of the values that we, I think, carry in the European Union. And I think, as you said, I think we can step up. We can really become part of the conversation and realize the function and the role that we can have with the values that we are promoting around openness, transparency, and collaboration, and I think stepping up in this time that we are right now, because at the core of this are also values around democracy and civilization and infrastructure, and they all relate to this. So I think there's also a certain political dimension to really need to move ahead. Um, and I know that there are a lot of conversations happening and the field is really moving ahead at a fast pace, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, there are still a lot of conversations to be had, a lot of stories to be told. And I know that everyone at the summit and also in this room can have a play a role in this and talking to their respective organizations, companies, institutions um, to continue this conversation. Thank you. And finally, Mirko would like to uh, 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 give an announcement. <laughs> So first, thank you everybody for joining today. Um, as in, in, in the opening statement, I said six months ago, we thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool to have a track that focuses on public sector open source at the Open Source Summit? And that was it today. And I certainly had a lot of fun. Um, I just wanted to announce one thing is that um, public sector actors are invited to join the Nostradation Europe as associate members. It costs you nothing. We have a few public sector actors, very uh, highly appreciated, who are already part of our group. And this, um, which comes for free, will give you access to the uh, public sector open source special interest group that uh, launches just now in this second. <laughs> um, you 
we figured out that joining is actually not super automatic, so you can email me, my email address is there, and I will sign you up. Um, you need a Linux Foundation ID, that's our login for the LFX platform, and then there um, we will manage this. There will be um, a monthly meeting to coordinate activities. I promise it won't be very long, and um, mostly we will be focusing on how can we enable concrete collaboration for open source projects between um, public sector actors of different levels of government and their development partners and stakeholders. Um, so the activities will complement, for example, what the to-do group does um, in, in enabling OSPOS to collaborate. Um, and here in this special interest group, you will be able to look into well, coordinating concrete development work, which I think is sorely missing. And as a teaser, why you should totally, absolutely join this group, is that from this group, we will select the program committee for the next public sector open source track at the next open source summit. So um, since then, you will be our recognized experts. You will be absolutely the ones to pick the next talks. This was my big announcement. Thank you very much for joining today. I learned a lot. Uh, I enjoy, enjoyed the presentations. I think we had a great program. And now I think it's time to go to the reception and have a very nice drink. <laughs>